Hello, brothers and sisters, here for another teaching time. Um, I'm torn between where to put this one. Is it questions answered, or is it um, just basics and fundamentals about prophecy and the rapture? Well, it's both. Um, I got a, a comment. I did a video, um, short video, about how you know Rosh Hashanah's passed, our chance for the rapture this year passed, and um, how everybody's starting to name all these dates that don't work and reasons why they might be doing it. And I had a comment, a couple comments, asking questions and also throwing out beliefs, best way to word it. But, you know, it's really good. And you know what? A lot of it, I'm just like, oh, I can't believe you think that. But you know what? I used to think those things. So let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out, this is going to probably be a lengthy video because I'm really going to go into detail with all this. I'm going to lay out kind of the gist of what was asked, and then we're going to work through it, okay? Um, and I'm going to do it in detail because I really want you to see this from Scripture. Okay, so the questions basically was, well, the rapture is not for everyone. It's just for the Christians and the Messianics, right? Jesus came, so all the laws of the Old Testament is gone as Jesus fulfilled them. Temple sacrifices like the red heifer, um, they are just all wrong for Christians. Yet, we look at the feast days. Why? Didn't Paul warn us about all this stuff? Why would the Christian rapture happen on a Jewish feast day? I know every in Genesis about the sun and the moon and the stars, but didn't Paul warn us about this? And then Galatians 4. Why do Christians overlook looking at God's holy days and overlooking Paul's warnings, particularly in Galatians 4? And that's like the that was the prime thing that this person wanted to know. You know, how does how can I, I look at read Galatians 4 and look at these other things. How do people do that? So this is what we're going to be looking at. These are the things. What I'm going to do is these questions actually, or comments actually lead perfectly into Galatians 4. So, and Paul's writings can be really confusing. Peter told us that, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. But, so I'm really going to ask you to stay with me through this thing so we get to Galatians 4, because people have thrown Galatians up at me all the time. But the problem is, they don't understand it. See, Paul wrote generally to church leaders, okay? He'd been in the area teaching and teaching, teaching. Then issues would come up, and he'd write to the leaders. But he didn't tell you what the issues were because the leaders knew. So if we don't get the background and we don't understand what's going on, you don't get it. Okay, so, this is, so we're going to dig in here. A couple of things just to preface things. One. By no means will I ever say that we are saved by the law. Uh -uh. Everybody needs Yeshua. Everybody needs Jesus, Jew or Gentile. Scripture is clear about that fact. Okay. But then once you're saved, what do you do? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. That's the fruit of how you know you're saved, how, how you know somebody's saved. Okay. Second. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Huh? What did he just say? A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So in other words, if you're taking a verse or a section of scripture without the appropriate context, you are setting yourself up. You're setting up a pretext. You're setting yourself up to take everything out of, pre, out of context. Okay, so when you're looking at the context, there's many different contexts. You have the, what the word actually says, what's around it, what's the intent of the letter, what's the intent of the, the, the writing, who is it written to, um, what are the, the idioms, are there any idioms involved in there, um, does it relate back to other scriptures elsewhere in the Bible, because the Bible cannot contradict itself. A lot of times stuff alludes and expects that you know something else that's in scripture. What are the, the, of that, the customs of that day? What are the different things that, you know, that everybody in that day would have understood? If I say Turkey Day in the United States, you know I'm talking about Thanksgiving, things like that. 
There's lots of different things with context that you have to understand. But again, the Bible cannot contradict itself anywhere. Who wrote it? Yeshua. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through the Holy Spirit, and I mean, the, you have a triunity, Holy Spirit, God, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, God, God, God. In the beginning, God created. God is the word God there is Elohim. It's plural. And how do you create man? In our image, plural. Okay. So it's all written by the same person, inspired through the Holy Spirit, which is God. Okay. So if there's a if there is something in this word, in this scripture that conflicts, there's only three possibilities of what can be going on. Either we're wrong, God's wrong or we don't fully understand it. And I'm in the camp that we just don't fully understand it. There's a lot to understand here. I've been doing this for a long time. I spent a lot of time digging into scripture and you know what, I'm still learning. So I just want you to keep those in mind. Um, the other thing I'll throw out, I was taught things growing up in traditional churches that I later learned were wrong flat out. These were pillars to my understanding of scripture. So whenever I'd read scripture that didn't like, that seemed weird to that, I'd, I'd push that scripture aside because I know that the Bible teaches this. Okay, those things, those untruths that we were learned, that we learned as a child growing up, at least in my life, are really hard to demolish, to get rid of. It's easier to learn a new truth than to unlearn something you've learned that's not true. Trust me, my children tell me this all the time. Little stupid things. I'll say, well, this, yeah, no, no, this is the largest dad. No, it's not. We look it up and they're right. But it's just something that I had tucked away in my mind that I held on to because I knew it was right. I hope you understand what I'm saying because I, I we might be demolishing some of those today. All right. So we're going to start off with the first question. The rapture is not for everyone. Yes, it is. It is for everyone. But not everybody's going to go. Okay, the rapture is one part of the resurrection to life. Um, if you, I'm not going to go there, but if you look in Daniel 12, it talks about a resurrection to life and a resurrection to, actually, let's, I'll go there. I want to make sure I get the wording right. And then with a few more minutes. Daniel 12. This scripture used to bother me when I first started studying scripture. Um, and many who sleep in the dust, excuse me, um, so let me start. Uh, chapter 12 talks about Michael standing up. It's time for war. There's going to be a time of trouble. That's Jacob's trouble. That's, that's um, tribulation. And then at that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone whose name is found written in the book of life or written in a book, the book of life. And many of those who sleep, to kick in mind, your people, this is Daniel. And many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake. Actually, everybody's going to awake. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. Okay, there's a resurrection to life and a resurrection to death. Resurrection to life has three parts. There are the fr first fruits. When Yeshua arose, he was the first fruits to the resurrection of life. And along with him were a bunch of the saints that came back to life in their bodies, and they walked around Jerusalem for a while. See, he couldn't have done it by himself. Long story. I've talked about it in some other videos. Okay? That's like the waving of the sheath in the temple. A sheath is a bundle. A stalk is one. It was a sheath. Then you have the re resurrection. That's the main harvest. All of this is talking about harvesting. It's in agricultural type terms. Okay, and then at the end, you come back and you get the gleanings, the stuff that's left on the ground. Those are going to be those people who basically have their head cut off because they didn't, they didn't take the mark of the beast. Okay, so it's for everybody. You know, let's go to 2 Peter 3.9. Unfortunately, not everybody is going to take it, to accept it. It's a free gift. Nobody's forcing you to take it. That would not be love. 
but a lot of people refuse to take it. You have people in your lives who refuse to accept that free gift. I know that because I do too. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack, slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, and that's the promise of his return, bringing in the millennial kingdom, or bringing in the kingdom of God, I should say. But as long suffering towards us, not willing that any of us shall perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. If you're the same the day before you met Jesus and the day after you met him, you didn't meet him. It takes time. Changes happen over time. But if there's no change in you, he's not. He, you may think you have a Savior, but you need a Lord and a Savior. And you'll notice that then he's talking about end time stuff. Hold your spot here, whatever. We're going to come back here in not too long. There's something else in there we want to look at. Go to Matthew 18, 14. Matthew 18, 14. Here we go. Even so... Not the will of your father who is in heaven, excuse me, even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He's not talking about children. A lot of people here think he is, but the, the conversation starts with at that time, uh, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Then who is the greatest of the well, who will be greatest in the kingdom? He's talking about believers. The little children are new believers that are coming to Jesus. They're not little kids, if you read that through in context. All right. Um, see, the, the issue is, do you have Jesus? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going. Okay. Now, but it says just Jews. Excuse me, let me say this again. The question was, is it just Christians and Messianics? Hmm. If you're a Messianic believer, are you still a Jew? If you're a Jew and you find Jesus, are you still a Jew? Yes. Jewish is, this, is lineage. It has to do with lineage. It, it, Jewish lineage is passed down from her mother, by the mother. Um, what's interesting is, not Nebuchadnezzar, um, Oh, the Medo Persian king who allowed the Jews to go back to build the temple. Uh, the name's eluding me. Sorry about that. Um, his mom was Queen Esther. Jewish lineage passed through the mom. He was a Jew. He's a Medo Persian king, but because his mom was a Jew, he was a Jew. Go real quick to Isaiah 26. I want to show you something else about this. We're going to see the rapture back in Isaiah. When Paul talked about the rapture as a mystery, that's a sowed. That's something that was hidden away in Scripture that hasn't been brought out. And it's meant to be revealed later. This is probably what he was referring to. So in other words, Yeshua didn't speak about the rapture. Paul is telling us something new. He's bringing out something new that was hidden in Scripture. And there's many a places by which he could have done it. Psalm 27 is another one. But anyhow, um, your dead, starting in verse 19, your dead shall live together with my dead body, and they shall arise, awake, and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Okay, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the, and the earth shall cast out her dead. Come, my people, not your people, it's my people, God's people, anybody who belongs to him. Enter your, your chambers, that's bridal chambers, that's the Hadar, that's where we're hidden away during the time of tribulation. Hide yourself, as it were, a little moment until the indignation or the wrath um Tribulation is past, but for behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for her inequity. Okay, you can keep reading that. Anyhow, the two points here. One, the we're going to look at it later when we look at the wedding feast, but the bride is in there for how long? Seven days. It's seven years of tribulation. But notice where we started. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. Isaiah is saying... When the rapture happens, I'm going. You don't get any more Jewish than that. Did he find Messiah? 
He hadn't even come yet. He may he may have gone with him in the in the first fruits, very possibly, but he he's going to arise one way or another. Okay, so we got to quit looking at Jew versus Gentile, and look more at like wheat versus tares. Who do you belong to? If you don't belong to Yeshua, you don't belong to Jesus Christ, then you belong to Satan, and he's yours or you're his. All right. Um, Let's go to Acts 2, 5, talking about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came down, who did he come down to? Yeah, 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 all the people in the upper room. We get that they were Jews. But when, um, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2. But when Peter makes his impassioned speech and the Holy Spirit comes down, we're not going to read through all of it. Acts 2, verse 5. Who did it, the Holy Spirit descend upon? The crowd's response. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's who it fell upon. They're Jews. But when it says devout men, that means they were obeying all the commandments, all the laws, all the everything. The, the judgments they were they were they were obedient to everything in the Old Testament. That's who the Holy Spirit came down on. A bunch of Jews. Hmm. So was the early church Christian or Jews? They were Jews, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, so how do this speech actually comes from Joel two? It's a prophecy in Joel two. Uh, 28 through 32, we don't need to go there. Actually, we will real quick. There's one interesting thing I want to show you in there. The book of Joel. Oh, too far. Two. Um, verses 28 through 32. I want you to look, and this is the same thing that Paul recited. Um, look at 29. It says, I will pour out uh, my maid servants and they'll pour out my spirit in those days. That's the time leading up to the last day, the last thousand years. Six days you work the land, or six days you work, one day you rest the Sabbath. Six years you work the land, one day you rest a Sabbath year for the land. Six thousand years were on earth, one thousand year millennial reign, starting with the rapture and tribulation. But notice it says down here, and this is something that Paul quotes off, uh, several times in the New Testament um, in verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word saved is escape, slip away. That's what it means in Hebrew. It's not saved. It's that you escape. Yes, we have an escape plan. We have an escape clause. It's called the rapture. We're not going through tribulation if you make the rapture, period. All right. So are Messianic Jews still Jews? I say yes. What did Paul say about that? Let's go to Acts 24. This is near the end of Paul's life, and Paul makes a confession. Acts 24. I'm sorry, 24, 14. I'm in the wrong place. But I confess this to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, we know the way is the early church, a sect, what does that mean? It's a sect of Judaism. It was considered a form of Judaism in the early days. The early church was Jewish. Hmm, interesting. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing in all the things which are written in the law and in the prophets. If Paul believes that in all the things that are written in the law, that's Torah, and in all the prophets, how could he be writing saying you don't have to follow it anymore? That's a conflict. That's where scripture appears to be conflicting with each other. Well, that's what we're going to look at. Okay. Um, see, but Paul's writings are interesting. Pete, what's, what did Peter say about about his writing. So go back to 2 Peter 3 
And Peter was scratching his head reading Paul's writings, big time. Okay, the scripture doesn't tell us he was scratching his head. I just know sometimes that's what I do when I'm confused. Oh, you know. There, I'm going to start at 14. I hate starting in the middle of a sentence. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. He's talking about the day of the Lord. He's talking about the coming back of, of Jesus. He's talking about the rapture, the millennial kingdom. He's talking about all of that. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to all these things, be diligent to be found um, by him in peace without spot or blemish, with no, gar with no sins on you worldly sense and considering the long suffering of the lord is salvation as also our beloved brother paul according to the wisdom given to him has written you as also in all of his epistles catch this speaking in them of things which are some things hard to understand which untaught unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do with the rest of the scriptures. So Peter is telling you it's really easy to misunderstand Paul's teachings and do it to your own destruction. We don't want to do that. That's why I'm doing this teaching. All right, next. Jesus came so that all of our laws are fulfilled. Done. Um, over. Fulfilled. Not destroyed. But fulfilled, you don't have to do them anymore. This is what I was taught from childhood. This is what I was taught church after church. At, we're going to go to Matthew 5. And we'll look at the verse where they say that he fulfilled everything. Um, Matthew 5. Anyhow, in fact, I remember I was in a very large church and I'm involved in everything. Yeah, imagine that, me being extroverted and getting involved in all kinds of different things. People thought I worked at the church. I didn't. I also led a large Bible study, a men's Bible study. And um, a guy came in talking about the feast and how we're supposed to do to follow Torah. And I lit into him. It's fulfilled. It's over. You don't have to. Why are you even bringing that to me? I actually had a con. It was a friend of mine had a conversation with one of the lead pastors there, talking about him. He's like, "Well, the pastor said if you want me to talk, tell him you can't go to your group." I said, "No, no, I'll handle it." It was interesting because I'm doing the. I'm saying the exact same things now that people say to me. Okay, but again, the law does not bring salvation. So the scripture everybody looks at in Matthew five. And I've got a nice big heading here that says Christ fulfills the law. Um, when this was written, there were no headings. There were no chapters. There were no verses. A lot of that's been, been put in to make it easier for us. This um, letter, the Sermon on the Mount, is one of the most beautiful pieces of Scripture ever. Oh, I can't, it's hard to say that. How you can say, compare Scripture against Scripture. It's a beautiful sermon. The problem people do is they take, try to take one verse and get a meaning from it and build a theology around it. You can't do that. You have to take it because it builds on each other. So what people do is they read verse 17 and they say, do not think I came to destroy the law of prophets. I did not come to, come to destroy it, but to fulfill. See that? It's fulfilled. Is that really what it's telling us? Let's read on. Whoever therefore breaks one of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, whoever does them and teaches them shall be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So do you want to be least in the kingdom or greatest in the kingdom? Some people say, well, nobody can fulfill all the law. So why try? If you're going to take a test, let's say you're a lawyer going for the bar exam, and there's no way you can get all the questions right. So why try, right? No. Okay, let's keep reading. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no, by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So at this point, the scribes and Pharisees are probably upset, and the people are scratching their heads like, how can I exceed their righteousness? Why? Because the law was never intended to save anybody. It doesn't do that. Okay, we'll look more about what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't, you're not saved by, you need Yeshua. Everybody needs Yeshua. We need him. The Jews need him, period. End of conversation. All right. 
So let's go back to, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, I came to fulfill. You have two Jewish idioms in here. The word says to destroy means to bend, twist, manipulate, try to make something say it doesn't say, therefore making it void or useless. To fulfill means to fulfill with understanding. So in other words, he's saying you have been taught wrong, and I'm going to teach you correctly. Okay, how do I know that? Well, it's right here. Let's look down, and we're just going to go to the beginning of a few verses. Verse 21, you have heard it said in the days of old that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. Uh, look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said in those old days, thou shalt not commit adultery. Look at um, verse 31. And it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of the divorce. But I say to you, look at 30, 33. You have again, you have heard that it was said of the days of old, you shall not swear falsely. Uh, verse 38. And you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, verse 43, and you have heard it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. <sighs> See, he's saying you were taught wrong. There was a problem with the teachings of the, the Pharisees and the sages. You were taught wrong. I'm coming to teach you correctly. And that's what that means. You get a problem here. If, if the law was done away with, is it all of the law, part of the law? What do we keep? What do you get rid of? See, the other thing is that, give me a minute. Then you're going to be given false prophets. Because all of the people in the Old Testament who were quoting God that said, do this forever and forever and forever are now false prophets. And that's most of your Old Testament. And then since the New Testament references the Old Testament a lot, what happens then? All those verses need to come out. All right. Well, it was just given to the Jews, right? It was for them. It wasn't for the Gentiles. Wrong. Uh, where do I want to go from here? All right. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to put a video in there. We are the stranger. Okay. The children of Israel coming out of Egypt was a mixed multitude. Twelve brothers their wives, and their children. In 430 years, I know you might say 400, but they were in bondage for 400 years. They were actually there for 430 years. The first 30 years, they weren't in bondage. All right. You know, they sort of forgot about them. A new pharaoh came in and put them under bondage. And they came out as 600,000 men plus women and children. They had big families back then. That's millions and millions of people. That ain't just being uh, overly productive. Uh -uh. That's what I've had Jewish people tell me that, oh, that was just a miracle of God. He made them overly productive. No, because there was, a, there was this stranger that was with him. A stranger is a non-Jew who ties himself to the Lord. Although I could be a Jew. Maybe I was part of the, uh, the Jews that were dispersed all around the world out of, out of the northern kingdom, out of Ephraim. Who knows? A lot of people are going to be Jews that don't know they're Jews. That'll be interesting, especially since a lot of people have a inherent, um, I don't want to say hatred of the Jews, but a disdain for anything Jewish in scripture. That came from Rome. That's not good. That's what Rome started. <sighs> don't get me started on Rome. All right. Fourth century, Constantine, he wanted to get rid of everything Jewish. He got rid of the Sabbath, instituted the, the, the Lord's Day that you worship on Sunday. The Catholic Church in their writings today will tell you that Sunday is not the Sabbath. Okay. Um, fourth beast of Daniel 7 sits on seven hills. Five have fallen. One is, one will be. It's a woman who sits on the, that there. Babylon the Great goes back to Queen Semiris. Um, Anyhow, that's a false religion sitting on a government. The five that were, 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 the one that was, was Rome. Rome was a demonically possessed kingdom. That's where the 
false religion set. They changed, they took the Jewishness out of everything. Yes, the Reformation, we reclaimed a bunch of stuff, but we didn't reclaim it all. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to put a video about the stranger in the links in the description. I do a video on it. It's really cool. And we're going to see a, a prophecy in a minute about that. Um, the other problem is if anybody who said something's forever, you take their stuff out, you, you're also getting rid of other things. The, uh, to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your body and soul. And I always mix up those words. That's the law. If we're getting rid of the law, we get rid of that. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's part of the law. If you get rid of the law, you get rid of that. Although now, if you're saying, well, no, you don't get rid of that part. So now you as a man are picking and choosing what part of the law to keep and what part of the law to save. Because the Ten Commandments, that's law. They go, well, no, keep the Ten Commandments. Are you choosing which of God's laws to keep and which to get rid of? Which ones did Jesus fulfill and which ones he didn't? That's dangerous. All right, let me keep moving on. All the temple sacrifice, red heifers, and the feast days are wrong for Christians. Why do we look at them? Are they wrong for Christians? Hmm. We're going to go to Ezekiel. Do a little walk through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 40 through 48 is the workings in the millennial kingdom. Okay. Um, this is after tribulation when Jesus, and there's things in here that people just, they have a serious problems with. All right. <clears throat> and they'll just say, well, no, it's not. It's not. Well, it is. This is the millennial kingdoms that we're looking at. Starting in, in chapter 40, understand that Paul, when he said um, that you're going to be raptured and you will be with the Lord forever. So wherever he goes, we go. Make sense? All right. Let's start in Ezekiel 43. And this counterpart is in Zechariah 14. For time's sake, we're not going to Zechariah 14. Afterwards, he brought me to the, the gate, the gate that faces towards the east, Ezekiel 43, starting in verse 1. And behold, the glory of God. What is the glory of God? That's Yeshua, that's Jesus, of Israel, came from the way of the east. And his voice was like the sounds of the thunders and many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Okay, this is when... Yeshua's feet come on the ground. He comes back the way he went up. He's on the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah tells you that the, or there's going to be an earthquake that's going to split the land north to south. Why? There was a Muslim guy, Solomon, back years, many, many, many years ago, who knew about this. And he's like, okay, well, you know what? A good Jewish boy is not going to walk through a graveyard. He'd be unclean. So they put a graveyard in between the two. Well, there's going to be an earthquake that's just going to split that apart. He's going to walk right through. Skip down to verse 7. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne. That's when Yeshua sets him up as a king. Jesus is only mentioned as a king after tribulation. The place of the soles of my feet. That shows ownership, okay? Remember in the book of Ruth, and Ruth, you had um, Boaz, and he was the kinsman redeemer, and he bartered and got the land, the land back for Ruth, was the kinsman redeemer. What did they do? The guy who was giving up the land took off and gave him a sandal. See, that shows ownership. It was part of the contract at that time. Because that sandal had the dirt of the land in there. So where you're standing shows ownership. So that's that's what it means when it says, this is the place of my throne and the place where the soles of my feet were. I, okay, that's what it's showing, ownership. Now go back to that parable that or the thing that Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out. He said, if anybody doesn't hear you, wipe the dust off your feet and move on. I've heard so many sermons, that dust will destroy your ministry, that dust will weigh you down, it will embitter you. No, 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 that's not what it is. Jesus is saying, I don't own those places. You know, let's keep going. Um, I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. 
So if Jesus is dwelling in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and we, being raptured, will be with Jesus forever, we must be part of this children of Israel. Yes, it was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. You following me? And by the way, the glory of God left the temple, the first temple, before it was destroyed by Babylon. You go back and you read, and I forget it's um, I forget the text. I want to say it's Ezekiel 8 and 11. Basically, it gave a whole litmus of things that they were doing against the law, not worshiping the law. They were worshiping, weeping for Tammuz. That's 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was like Baal's son or Queen Samiris' son. Long story, but that's where you get lint from. That, that is the 40 days weeping for Tammuz. That's what it is. Um, so this is the millennial kingdom. Because Jesus ain't coming back to Armageddon, and then he's going to walk through the eastern gate. He's there, and he's there with the children of Israel. And if we're not part of the children of Israel, we're not with him. All right, let's keep going on. What's going to happen? And you can read this. I mean, it's kind of boring and dry sometimes. Some of this stuff is really cool. Somewhere in there it tells you that in the temple, the windows are going to be beveled out. Normally, they bevel windows in. So you get, uh, excuse me, they're going to be beveled inwards or whatever. It's going to let more light out. Normally, it's to let more light in. It's actually kind of cool. In 44, it gives in verse 10, and the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me, and the altars and others shall bear their inequity. But anyhow, it's it's gonna it gives you the description of what the 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 priests are gonna be doing. Okay. Go down to 23, and here's what they're gonna be teaching in the millennial kingdom. They will teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Oh, clean and unclean. That's the foods that you're supposed to eat or not eat. That's, you know, not eating piggies, shrimp, shellfish, mice. Yeah, you're not supposed to eat mice, bats, a lot of things you're not supposed to eat. This is what they're going to be teaching people to discern between. In controversy, that doesn't mean people are going to be, it's all controversy about these things that they're teaching. No, no, no. If there's a dispute between two people, if there's a, if there's a controversy, it needs to be settled. They shall stand in my judges, as my judges. How will they judge? They will judge it according to my judgments. That's Torah. And judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws, Torah, and my statutes, and all of my appointed meetings. Those are the feast days. Um, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. That's the Sabbath, Saturday. That not Sunday, that's also um, the, the um, Sabbath year from the land, the Shemitah year. This is going to be happening in the millennial kingdom. So if Jesus fulfilled it, you don't have to do it anymore. Nobody told him, because this is what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. And if you're with Jesus, you're going to be doing this. All right, let's keep going. This is the cool one. Is there anything else I want to do in here? Go to 47. We're going to talk later in Galatians 4 about inheritance. Okay, Ezekiel 47 is talking about the borders for the land. It's not Israel that we know today. It's the original Israel given to Abraham. I've had people sitting there saying, that can't be. Everybody's not going to fit in there. That's for God to figure out, not me. If he tells you it's going to happen, it's going to happen. All right. It shall be that when you divide it, the land, by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the stranger, us, who dwells among you and bears children among you. Oh, we're going to be having kids. How? Resurrected bodies? How do you have kids? I've had people say, you can't have kids with resurrected bodies. Oh, yeah, give me a scripture that says that. What do we know that the resurrected body actually means? Not a whole lot. But here it tells us we're going to be having kids. Cool. I like kids. They shall be as native-born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Oh, we'll be native-born. And it shall be that whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him 
his inheritance, says the Lord God. You see Lord God put together like that? That's a definite. That's definitely going to happen. Where do you want to live? Hey, the Dead Sea is going to have some really good fishing if you're into fishing. Do you want to be close to Yeshua at the temple? Maybe you want a little beach bill out on the Mediterranean, kick back, catch some rays. Where do you want to be? You're going to have a choice. This is where we're going to be. This is our inheritance. And we're going to be following all of the law. Seems foolish, but Jesus never got rid of it. He didn't. Okay, and we're going to see Paul didn't either, but we'll get there. And we see that in Galatians, but we got to get there first. So we got some more questions to answer. <sighs> Give me a minute. Didn't Paul warn us about these Jewish days and all of that? Did he? We're, we're get, we get to Galatians 4, we're going to look at that closer. But let's look at a couple other things that Paul said. We already heard that Paul said... Give me a minute. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any verses here. Let's look at a couple of the things Paul said, okay? And Paul's not a hypocrite. He's not saying one thing to one group of people and not saying something else to another. You know, he's not doing that. If he did, you'd have to take everything he said and just throw it out of the Bible. Let's go to Romans 10.4. 10.4, good buddy. I don't believe I said that. Anyhow, Romans 10, 4. Again, if you see a contradiction in Scripture, either you're wrong, God's wrong, or you don't understand it. And for me, I know it's I don't understand it, and I have to start digging in. Luckily, i got a great resource where to dig in. I'm not just talking about the Bible. It's a teacher that I have that is just amazing. Um, Romans 10, 4. And this is one that gets thrown up at me all the time. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So that makes your case. Yep, Christ ended the law, right? Nope. So what I'm going to do is go into my phone. I'm going to pull up Bible Gateway. That's a blue letter Bible. That's what I like to use. I'm going to go to Romans. 10 and look at verse 4. And I'm going to pull up that word as to what it means. It's telos. Root word, entomology, from a primary telo to set out for a definite point or goal. Oh, that's not the end. That's not termination. It can mean termination, but there's another word in, in Hebrew that would be used for a for an end point like done over with and that's teleos but it's all in the in the New Testament they always put them as end this is a goal for Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes all right Let's go, and that would make more sense. Otherwise, if he was the end of the law, this wouldn't make sense. Go to Romans 3, 31, but we're going to read it in context. And again, Paul's very confusing. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Yes, there is nothing about salvation from the law. The law never was meant to bring salvation. Yeshua was. What do you think Yeshua means? Salvation. Or excuse me. Yeah, Yeshua means salvation. Jesus, Jesus is just Jesus. But Yeshua means salvation. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Holy Spirit only came down on the Jews. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised, the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. Jew and Gentile, we don't need a vision. They're saved the same way. Do, but so now here's the question. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. That doesn't sound like Paul saying you got rid of it and did away with it, does it? Was Paul conflicted or confused? 
Hmm. All right, let's move on. We are going to get to Galatians 4, but give me some time. Because a lot of these things, these verses or whatever, I'm going to be referring back to them as we read Galatians 4. Because Galatians 4 is a little confusing. It is. But we're going to sort that out. All right. So why does a rapture have to happen on a Jewish feast day? I've heard this question so many times. I love it. I love it. First of all, where do I want to start? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5.8. 1 Corinthians 5.8. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't Paul get rid of the feast? Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread and sincerity of truth. He's saying, let's still keep Passover. Wait, but Jesus already was crucified on Passover. He fulfilled it. Why would you still keep it? Paul's saying, let us still keep that feast. Hmm. Yeah. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. A rapture verse. Good. Let's go back to 52 through uh, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is a sowed, something hidden. We talked about this, something hidden in scripture that wasn't meant to be brought out till a later time. You'll see it all through Old Testament, New Testament, where, where writers will say, I'm showing you a mystery. This is a mystery. He's referring back to where Isaiah said, when the rapture happens, I'm going, count me in. We shall not all sleep. That word sleep is only used for people who have died that are going to be resurrected to life. It's never used for people who are going to be resurrected to death. But we sh shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Ah. Last trump. There are three named trumpets in Scripture. Okay, there's the first trump that was blown um, at Mount Sinai when the mixed multitude was betrothed to God and they said, I do to all of the laws and they were given the Ten Commandments. Do you know what day that was? That was Pentecost, the same day that the Holy Spirit came down. Is there a connection? Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Go with me real quick to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. See, when Paul speaks about the rapture, one of the things he says to the Thessalonians, uh, come on, David, all the T's are together. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. This is in the middle. First Thessalonians 4.13 down to like 5.11 is all talking about the rapture. In the middle of it, he takes a break and forget about where chapter 5 starts. That wasn't in scripture when it was written. But concerning the times and the seasons, that's the feast days. Seasons, oh, we know the seasons. We see the signs. We know the seasons. No. Go to Ecclesiastes 3.1. We're not going to turn right now um, for everything. Every purpose for God, there is a season. The birds made a song about it for us old farts. You know, turn, turn, turn. So for everything God does, there's a season. That word season in Hebrew is zamond. It means a set time. But concerning the times and seasons, brothers, I have no need I should write to you. Why didn't he write to them about it? Because they knew it. If they didn't know it, know it, then he would have to write to them about it in order for them to understand what he's saying about the rapture. Okay, let's keep going. But if we don't know the times and the seasons, can we understand what he's saying about the rapture? Nope. Again, he, if, if they didn't know it, he would have had to have written to them about it. All right. 
so going back to um so this is talking about Paul Wayne. I don't know if I mentioned this. The obvious reason why we still look at the temple and the red heifers is Daniel 9, 27, that he confirms the covenant with one for one seven. In the midst of that seven, there'll be an abomination of desolation. So during tribulation, there has to be a temple. And at the midpoint of tribulation, uh, the Antichrist will set up something in, the, uh, something in the temple that defiles it, and it will cause the offerings to cease. When you see the temple being set up and you're seeing sacrifices being possible, yeah. But understand that Yeshua is going to be reigning in a temple and they're going to be doing all the sacrifices in the millennial kingdom as well. Yeah, it's in Ezekiel. Okay, so again, why does a rapture have to happen on a Jewish feast day, even though Paul said it has to happen then? People don't get the last trump. It's an idiom. First trump, Mount Sinai. Last trump is Rosh Hashanah. Um, there's Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of Trumpets. 100 blows of the Shafar, nine sets of 11 and one last trump. It's a Jewish idiom. Ask any Jew, a learned Jew, about a last trump. They'll, they know it's Rosh Hashanah. You may have to jog their memory, but they know it. Um, and then there's the great trump, which is Yom Kippur. That's the one mentioned in Matthew 24. Guess what? Different trumpet, not the rapture. Matthew 24 does not talk about the rapture. It, the only time that Jesus spoke about the rapture is when he alluded to it in the wedding feast. All right, we went to Isaiah already. That's where Isaiah said, I'm going. And that's where Paul probably got his sowed from. Um, Genesis 1. I know Genesis 1 with the sign, the moon, and all that, but Paul warned us about this. Did he? Okay, you'll see it in uh, when we do get to Galatians 4, but let's just go back to Genesis 1 so we're all in agreement and understanding. So we maybe not about all agreement, but you understand what's being said from Scripture. <laughs> We've been quicker to shut my Bible and started that way. Genesis 1, verse 14, I believe. First of all, in Genesis 1, how many Jews are there? Zero, none. This is the beginning of creation. Then God said, there, let there be lights in the firmament um, of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, that's a banner, like a rallying point, and seasons, that's appointed times. These are all the feast days. Moed, same word we'll see in Leviticus 23, and we're going to turn there next. And for days and years, that's his calendar, not the pagan calendar that we're using now. God puts his appointments on his calendar. This was set up from the creation of time to tell us the set time that Yeshua is going to be crucified, the time that he's going to be in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the time that he's going to be the first fruits of the resurrection of life on the Feast of First Fruits. These are his appointed times, and he will fulfill the fall one still. Let's go to Leviticus 23. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. I did that in the first, um, I spent some time there in the first one. The first video in the series about the basics with regard to prophecy. Leviticus 23. I want to point out one thing. Read verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which shall proclaim at their appointed times. Who do they belong to? These are the feasts of the Lord. They're God's, they're Jesus's. Feast is Moed, same word we just saw for seasons in Genesis 1, 14. It means appointed times. Convocation is a gathering, bringing everybody together, but it's also a rehearsal. These are rehearsals for God's appointed times or for the Lord's appointed times. Um, look down at, oh, we can go back up to verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel, children of Israel, mixed multitude, and say to them, the feast of the Lord you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. They are my feast. 
the Lord saying that. So my question is, why do we call them Jewish feasts? Because he had the Jews celebrate them. Well, they were the Jews were chosen people, but these belong to the Lord. Hmm. Give me a second. Now on to Galatians four. But in order to understand Galatians four, you got to understand the backstory. Why was the letter written? What was going on? What precipitated it? So we, we find that in the story that happens in Acts 15. So before we can go to Galatians 4, we need to go to Acts 15. Acts 15, conflict over circumcision. Actually, there's a lot more than that. But this is talking about Galatia. How do we know that? Let's go to verse 20. Um, 21 in, in chapter 14. And when they had preached the gospel to the, the city that made disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Guess what? They are all cities in Galatia. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Okay. So now these cities that are mentioned are all Galatians. But anyhow, then it says, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discussions and dispute with them, and they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Okay. Big discussion, big argument, big fight broke out between these certain men that came down from Judea, along with Paul and Barnabas, that they decided they all need to go to the council of the elders and apostles in Jerusalem to sort this whole thing out. Is this about the law? No. What is it about? Customs, not law. Big difference. <sighs> Before we move forward, let's look at another place where we talk about customs. Let's go to Mark 7, because there is a huge difference between the law and rabbinical law, man-made law. Okay, so let's go to Mark 7. And see that Yeshua weighed in on this issue. He talked about it. Mark said, sometimes it, I'm thinking in my head and it's me so, it's so hard to turn pages sometimes. Here we go, Mark 7. The Pharisees and some of the scribes, and the scribes were not just like little, you know, guys with a pocket protector and all the pens in their pockets that were just taking notes. No. The scribes were the ones that were writing out all the scripture, but they were more like the lawyers of the day. They knew the law. They knew the Torah better than anybody, even better than the Pharisees. So they, they held an important position. They were the wise men. Haven't we heard wise men before? Remember the wise men came from the East? Yeah, they were scribes. The greater yeshuva, the greater teaching area at that time was in Babylon, not Jerusalem. You weren't going to have a bunch of wise men from Babylon coming and worshiping a little baby. Eh, another story. We'll save it for later. Um, we'll save it for the time when Yeshua was born. Ah, that just passed. Tabernacles. Another story. I know, I know. We were always told Christmas. It's not. Anyhow. And the Pharisees and scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eating bread with, uh, with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found salt. Does it mean their hands were dirty? No, no, no. They had a particular little vessel that has two handles on it. And you would wash your hands in this ceremonial hand washing. You'd take this hand and do that. And then you'd grab this handle and do this. Hopefully you don't drop it in the middle. Because if I did that, I just dropped it. Is that in scripture? No, it's not. This is a custom. 
something that the pharmaceuticals made up and said, you have to do this before you eat. Otherwise, it's unclean. You're defiled. You you're can't go into the temple. You're sinful. Oh, my goodness. If you don't do this, it's not in Scripture. It is a commandment of men. We're going to read about the commandments of men. They're not good. So the, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. Holding the traditions of the elders. All right. Um, I'll keep reading and then I'll, I'll give you my, my take on all this. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things. Catch that. There are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. All right. So the, and then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not work according to the tradition of the elders? But they eat bread with unwashed hands. Anywhere in here, as they said, that they're breaking Torah. Are they talking about the laws of God? No, not one. All right, let me, I'm going to stop here and just tell you this. There are 613 do this, don't do that's in the law. Some are temporary, some are permanent. There are verb tenses that you can only see in Hebrew, and you got to really know Hebrew to see them, that will tell you if it is temporary or permanent. There are also something called a, um, what is it called? A prophetic perfect tense, where the verb tells you that something that looks like it already happened, and you see this in the book of Revelation, which it was written in Hebrew. Much of the New Testament was. But anyhow, um, where it looks like it's already happening, it's a pr prophetic perfect tense. In other words, it's so perfect, it's going to happen so assuredly, it's written like it already did. That's common in Hebrew. We don't catch it in the English. So you need somebody who understands this, who's teaching you. That I have. Actually, he teaches advanced Hebrew, so it's really good to have him. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect one of his videos onto this. It's john1415.org. No, he doesn't look at my videos and approve them or anything. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on everything. But he's where I'm getting a lot of my learning from, john1415.org. If you forget that, the verse is, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So they're talking about these rabbinical laws, 613 laws and things in the Bible, tens of thousands of rabbinical laws. They call them the fences. It's to keep you away. Like if, if breaking a law is like a hole in the ground, you're going to want to put a fence around it so you don't even get close to it. See, the, the rabbis got to the point where they were more worried about them being worshipped, them being honored. Oh, they were bad shepherds, bad shepherds. They were dogs. We'll look at that. Anyhow, that they cared more about following these man-made things or the fences than the other ones, than, the other, uh, than God's commandments. It's kind of like this. If something in Torah said, don't touch the stove, because it's hot and you'll burn your finger. Then a rabbi would come in and say, well, don't go into the kitchen. So you don't go into the, or don't touch the stove so you don't touch the burner, whatever. And then somebody else say, don't go into the kitchen so you don't touch the stove so you don't touch the burner. Somebody else would say, well, don't go into the house so you don't go into the kitchen so you don't touch the stove so you don't touch the burner. Next thing you know, you're outside cold and hungry because of the fences. And it, those fences go on and on and on. Have you ever noticed a Jewish person will not eat meat and cheese together? They will not have a roast beef and cheese sandwich. Is there anything in the Bible that says do not have a roast beef and cheese sandwich? No. What does it say? Do not eat like a baby. I think it's a baby goat or a baby calf boiled in its mother's milk. So in order to make sure that doesn't happen, just no meat and no dairy together, period. That's a fence. All right. They're not good. Jesus and the, and the Pharisees clashed over these all the time. Okay. So here's how Jesus responded to this particular um, thing. We're talking about the customs, the traditions of man. Well, Isaiah prophesied. Did, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? <sighs> hypocrites, actors. You're acting one way, but inside you're another. 
It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, that's worthlessness, amounts to nothing. In vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, is there a problem with them? No, they laid them aside. You hold the traditions of men. You washing the pitchers, the cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, um, and he who curses, on, where you can read the rest. So this is talking about defenses. This is talking about man-made problems. I'll tell you this. In the first four teachings, uh, excuse me, first four parables that Jesus told, he basically said by the time he comes back, all of the church and all the synagogues are going to be full of leaven, full of bad teaching. In the churches, to, in the synagogues today, they don't teach out of Torah. They teach out of the Talmud, the commandments of men. In the church, we teach lawlessness, that the law has been fulfilled. It's over with. It's done. You don't have to do it anymore. Um, I'll put a video on that. Attach it. Um, where do I want to go? Give me a minute. This, by the way, is Isaiah 29, 13. Let's go there real quick. I'm not sure exactly why I have it listed since I think we just read it. There may have been something different because a lot of times when you get a quote from the Old Testament, it's not quite the same. But again, whenever a rabbi, a teacher mentions something out of the Old Testament or out of, out of another book in the Bible, he's expecting you to go there and look at it. Insomuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. Uh, um, these are the fences, the commandments of men. Therefore, behold, I will do a marvelously work among these people, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of, of their wise men shall perish. And their understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden because they're not doing the right job. Um, woe to those who seek deep and hide counsel. There was something in here I wanted to see, and I'm not seeing it right away. So we want, this in no way condemns the law. Jesus didn't do that. All right. Where are we going to go from here? Um, so you have the law, Torah, and then you have rabbinical law, the fences, completely different. In fact, you were you could be put to death for breaking the rabbinical laws, and they were more likely to punish the rabbinical laws than they were to punish the law of God. All right. Let's go to Matthew 22. Um, I will get there. I will get back to Galatians. I will, which we're going to go back to Acts first. 22, 37 through 40. All right. Torah. I mean, Jesus and the scribes, and they're questioning him. They're trying to catch him up and get a question where there's no good answer. So they ask him a question. It says a lawyer, verse 35, a lawyer, that's a scribe, asked him a question, testing him, saying, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Did, did he say, well, you know what? The law is going to be abolished as soon as I'm crucified, so you don't have to worry about it. No, he didn't. How did he answer? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law of the prophets and the prophets. So in other words, those two, everything else comes from that. It's attached to it. You can't have the top part without all the rest. They come as a group. Okay, if you get rid of the law, you got to get rid of loving your God. 
can't do that. But again, can man decide which laws to keep and not? No, no. All right, let me go further here. Let's go to... Matthew 9, verse 13. All right. Before we go there, let me explain something else. Light and heavy. This is, we're just teaching about the law. Okay. If two laws seem to conflict, which is more important? Okay. Um, we saw that. We're not going to go to the script, these scriptures, but you, hopefully you'll know the stories. Um, Jesus' disciples were out in the field picking wheat because they were hungry. And the, the and then we're on the Sabbath, and the um, the Pharisees come and say, oh, why are they breaking the law? They're working on the Sabbath. Okay. Were they harvesting the field? No. Were they storing it away? No, they're eating. Was there any law about eating in somebody else's field? No, you could do that. See, they're hungry. You can eat. That's more important. So that, but the scribes are more interested in like the little, you know, minutia, everything of the law. So what do you do next? It's interesting. Go back and read the story. It says he went and the, uh, the next Sabbath, he went to their synagogue. And that's where he healed the man that had the withered hand. And they got all upset with him for healing on the Sabbath. And he said, well, which of you, if your ox is an ox that fell in a hole, wouldn't help get him out? Okay, what's more important? How is it that this, uh, the Pharisees or the, the priests could work on the Sabbath? Because that's more important. What did Jesus say about this light and heavy thing? Okay, let's go to um, Matthew 9.13. See, a lot of people don't understand the law. But see, this is the stuff that's in um, Galatians 4. And you'll see that, hopefully. 9.13. Um, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to, excuse me, to repentance. Wouldn't salvation be the right word to put there? No, to repentance. You can't have salvation without repentance. All right. Um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This comes from Hosea. Okay. So let's go to Hosea 6.6. 6. See, by the way, if you get rid of the Old Testament, you got to get rid of what Jesus just said, because that came out of the Old Testament. And most of the New Testament comes from the Old Testament. There's allusions to the Old Testament. Oh, my goodness, you'd be ripping out so much. Hmm. Would you even have a crucifixion? Because you got three places in the Old Testament to tell you that you're going to have a crucifixion. Anyhow, Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The knowledge of God refers to the law, okay? But see, he wants mercy. He wants you to be loving on others more than like tithing the little bit of cumin. You know, as I observed the Sabbath today, if actually almost somebody else lived really close to they did it, I was going to go cut somebody's lawn. I do that for a living. But it was really an outreach project. A church had been paying for this. Uh, person who's really homebound and everything um, to cut the grass, but the people were charging him and not cutting the grass, and it's kind of tall, and he wanted me to go out and cut it. Would I do that on a Sabbath? Sure. I'm working for God. This is not something I'm doing working for myself. I am honoring the Sabbath by serving somebody else. That's mercy, not sacrifice. Um, I'm not saying you don't have to sacrifice yourself. Yeah, there are some things you sacrifice, but it's not a matter of making sure you tithe and do this and wash your hands. A certain, you got to separate what's for, from God and what's for man, but also what is more important. A dear, dear friend I met on Facebook, loved this person um, in a godly way, and we talk all the time. They were concerned. They were heading out. They forgot their water. Can I stop and buy water on the Sabbath? I'm like, of course you can. You know, light and heavy. What's more important? 
Okay, and those are decisions we make. Um, let's go to Matthew. Why do I have that there? Give me a second. And then let me see what I'm looking at and why I have that there. And if I want to go there. Yes, I do. Go ahead and go to Matthew 5, 25, 23 and 24. And we see this embodied, this whole thing of loving people first before your sacrifice. You know, you give your tithe or whatever. Um, therefore, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your, on your way. First, be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer the gift. He doesn't want us mindlessly following the Torah and following it. He wants to follow it. But he says, you know, why call me Lord, Lord, not do what I say? He wants you to be loving others first. Again, loving God with everything you got and loving your and loving your neighbors. Everything else streams down from that. That's what the law is. A lot of people think they, they mix it up, they confuse it, and they don't understand the difference between rabbinical law and other law. One other thing about the law, and then we're going to go back to the story that we were looking at in Acts, and then we're going to go and dissect part of the book in Galatians, okay? So I want you to go to Deuteronomy 28. And the law is all over the place. This is just one place with it, but this is sort of a compendium in a way of what it is and what it's about. Yeah, we have to go in. Let's go to Matthew, Tim. Now it shall come to pass that if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed you shall be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground and the increase of your herd. And it goes on and on. It gives you all these blessings for following the law. What you won't find there is anything eternal. It was never intended for that. Then skip to verse 15. But it shall come to pass, not that it might, it says it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, his statutes that I command you today, that all of these curses will come upon you. Cursed you shall be in the city, and cursed you shall be in the country, and cursed shall be the basket of your needing. It goes on and on. Actually, you, in verse 36, you see them getting, in, in Deuteronomy 28, in verse 36, you see them taken off to, to uh, Babylon in verse 64. That's the Roman dispersion. Okay. See, the law is meant to take care of you, to nurture you, to bless you. By doing it, God will bless you. You can't expect him to bless you if you don't. Jesus did not get rid of this. If he got rid of it, he got rid of loving God, too, and he got rid of loving your neighbor. All right, But this is going to be talked about in Galatians 4. That's why I'm bringing it up to you. Before we go there, before we go back to Acts, one other thing. In the Great Commission, what are we supposed to teach people? I know to make disciples, not what we're supposed to do. When, what are we supposed to teach them? And a disciple is a student. What do we teach them? Hold your place here in Deuteronomy 28, and let's go to Matthew 28. Starting in verse, I'm sorry, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all of the things I have commanded you. Wait a minute. To observe all the things I commanded you. Who wrote Deuteronomy? Jesus. Jesus did. Now it shall come to pass if you generally obey the voice of the Lord and careful and 
and to observe carefully all of his commandments. Is it a coincidence that they're worded the exact same? No. All right. Let's go back to Acts 15. And this is the Jerusalem Council, another book that is very misunderstood. All right. So the certain men came down, and, and, and according to certain, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. All right. So in other words, these are pharmaceutical men that want you to, to, to observe the man-made commandments, the commandments of men, which Isaiah warned them about that Jesus threw up in their face. Hmm. But some of the certain sect of Pharisees, and went verse 5, of the Pharisees who believe rose up saying, it is necessary to, uh, we're in Jerusalem already. So, but some in the certain in sect of the Pharisees, these are all Jews, the way the Pharisees, these are all sects of Judaism, um, rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. That's fine. Law of Moses is fine. Um, verse 7. Okay, verse 6. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter. And then, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to the men, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word and the gospel to believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them. Wait, he made no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Again, it's not a Jewish-Gentile thing. It's wheat and tares. Who do you belong to? You are saved the same way by Yeshua, period. You're saved by grace through faith. But, yeah, let's go. Go to go with me to um, James verse 19, uh, James 2:19. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. People, faith through grace, no works. Your faith is dead. We just, I just went through this and doing the one of my teachings in the book of Revelation with the uh, church of Sardis, the dead church. I'm telling you, those works are not those wonderful things that you think you did. It's following the law. Huh? Really? Yeah. Go to Matthew. Matthew 7. I'm not going to do all of it. I know I'm running really long on this recording. Go to 22. And many will say to me in that day, starting with the rapture, tribulation, last thousand years. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Look at all these amazing things that we did in your name. Look at what we did. Look at our works. In 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? The condition of being without Torah, either by choice or ignorance. All right, back to Acts. Ah. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, and neither are that which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Are yokes good or bad? It depends. Yoke means law. Oh, they're not supposed to put a law on them. Well, let's go to Matthew 11. But it is. Yoke is like a Jewish idiom. It's a word that's talking about the law. Matthew 11. Jesus spoke about a yoke. Uh, 
11.30. Oh, that's 12, no wonder it didn't look right. Um, starting 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what the Sabbath is. It's a, a Shabbat Shalom, a Sabbath rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, that's Torah. That's the way Torah is supposed to be. The 613 things, not the tens of thousands of fences that get put in rabbinical law. Okay, back to Acts. And, you know, they have a long conversation, and then it says, James answered, saying, men are brethren, listen to me. That's in verse 13. And then he's still talking. Um, yeah, we got to go there. Let's read through it. Simon has declared how God, Simon would be Peter, how God at first visited the Gentiles to take, to take out of them a people for his name. Notice it said he didn't talk to him about eating piggies or not, because that's not what that story is about. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Hmm, that's the Gentiles. Oh, it even says that. For all of the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Uh, we've got to go see this. Because there's actually, it's a little different when it was written in the book of Amos. Get rid of the Old Testament. This is gone. Look at Amos. Let's go to Amos. Amos 8 is how we know that when they shorten the days during tribulation, it's just the amount of daylight is going to be shortened, not the number of days. But this is Amos 9. On that day, oh, starting in verse 11, on that day, what day? The day of the Lord, starting at the rapture, tribulation, the millennial kingdom. On that day, I'll raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins, and I will rebuild it as in the days of old. This is Yeshua doing it. This is not the tabernacle or the temple that the Jews are going to build. This is the one God's going to build. That they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. So, wait a minute. The Gentiles are going to be in this temple of David in Jerusalem. Yeah, we looked at that earlier in Ezekiel. Let's look at it in Isaiah 56. And you're going to see something even wilder. Isaiah 66, 56 is salvation to Gentiles. It's really cool. That's what it talks about. I'd love to go through this whole thing, but I could do an hour just in here. And if you've gotten this far as me, God bless you, brothers and sisters. But um, just read, what, what verses do I want to look at? We're just going to do two of them, six and seven. Also, the sons of the foreigner, that's, that's us. That's the foreigners, the people who have tied themselves to the Lord that are not Jews. These are the strangers who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and love the name of his Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. We're supposed to keep from defiling the Sabbath? Yeah. And hold fast to my covenants. That's his laws. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. So we're going to be doing sacrifices on the altar of God in the temple. Mm -hmm. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for, uh, for all nations. Remember Jesus had his temple tantrum? 
He said, you know, you, you, my house should be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. This is what he's talking about. They were supposed to be bringing the Gentiles in. They weren't doing it. If you read from 9 through 12, it's talking about the shepherds and how bad they were. Um, and it calls them dumb dogs. That's actually disgusting. A dog, metaphorically, is a male prostitute, somebody that has sold themselves out to Rome. Not a sexual thing, uh, but it was because they had sold themselves out to Rome. This is so bad, how bad the Pharisees and everybody were. I mean, go down to 12. Verse 12, come, one says, I will bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink and tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. They're saying that they were feeding off the sheep rather than feeding the sheep. That's why Jesus came as the good shepherd. All right, so anyhow, we're back into Acts 15. I know we're all over the place here. Okay, so, and um, James is talking again. It says, therefore, I judge. That means he's the nice, nice see. He's the one that's a leader of the Jerusalem council. He's the one in charge. This is the half-brother of Jesus, probably the guy that was at the door when Jesus was doing all the miracles and having a big party in somebody's house. And they said, hey, your mother and brother here, and they want you to come outside. I think they probably wanted to talk some sense into him because he was getting a little crazy with all of his miracles and everything. This is probably the same brother. Can't prove it. Now he's leading this crazy sect of Judaism called the Way. Therefore, I judge, and this is where people get this really confused, that we should not trouble those from the Gentiles who are turning to God. Are these like fervent believers? No, they're just starting to turn to God. They're just starting to turn to Yeshua. Just starting. But to write to them to abstain from all things polluted by idols, from sexual idolatry, and that's a huge list right there when you realize what all of those things encompass, from things strangled and from the blood. This is to get into the door to the synagogues. And then what does it say? For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city and read in the synagogues every Sabbath. In other words, these new people that are coming, like in Galatia, because all of this is really written about the Galatians. In Galatia, they just need to do these few little things, and then they can get into the temples where everything else that Moses has taught is read every Sabbath. Hmm. Now, now let's go to Galatians, Galatians 4. And I appreciate if you're still with me. See, Galatians 4, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to give you a teaching on Galatians 4. It's not written trying to tell people not to keep the law anymore. It's Paul talking to people that are saying you have to keep the man-made laws, the rabbinical laws, the laws that honor men, the commandments of men. Those are the people that were coming to Galatia saying, you have to follow these commandments of men to be saved. That's the issue being talked about here. All right. <clears throat> now, I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, that word child is like an infant somebody that's incapable of making decisions to care for themselves, does not differ from all from a slave. Why? Because as a child, you do what your parents tell you to do. You don't question it, you do it. If not, you get spanked, what you used to. Um, don't spare the child, don't spare the rod, and whatever the child knows. Anyhow, though he is a master of all, one day he will be a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards. These are the people that take care of the house, that take care of the children, okay? Until the time appointed by the father. Okay, now think about this. There's going to talk about inheritance, that, you know, a child's going to get an inheritance. A lot of times if there's money available to a child, it'll be put into a trust fund. And it may stipulate what day the money can come available. Who sets that date? The father does. Could be 21, could be 30, could be till they get married, could be till they get a job and settle down. No. Okay. Because the father is taking care of what's best for them. All right. There's another play on words here. 
See, this is also talking about following God's laws because that's what provides for us. We read about that in Deuteronomy 28 until the time appointed, the appointed times, the feast days that told us about the time that Christ would be crucified, told us the time he would be in the um, in the ground in unleavened bread, told us the time that he was going to be arise from the dead on the feast of first fruits, and it tells us the time he's going to come his second time around. Okay. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. Is that in bondage of the law? No. Elements of this world. That is the rabbinical teachings, the commandments of men. All right. Even so, we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time, in other words, when the appointed time, going back up to there, to the appointed time, the feast days, had come, the son sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. Born under law, he was a Jew, okay? And he was born on tabernacles. God with us. You know, Yeshua, his name shall be called God with us, Emmanuel. That's tabernacles. They said joy to the world. Joy to the world, joy, the most joyous time of the year. No, it's not Christmas, it's tabernacles. Everything about his birth screams tabernacles. <sighs> so, um, so born under law, to redeem those who were under the law. Yeah. Did the law save them? No. He was sent to redeem them. He was sent to the Jews first. Throughout the Old Testament, it talks about that they have a Messiah coming. They've been waiting for that Messiah. They just missed it. Why? Because he wasn't doing the commandments of men. That's why they missed him. That we might receive adoptions as sons. That's the promise, that we become sons of God. But you have to accept Yeshua. The Jews need him. We need him. And because we, I'm sorry, to redeem those that were under law, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. Were they a, what were they a slave to? Let's go back. So is it a slave of the law, that terrible law thing? No. Go back. They were bondage to elements of this world. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God through Christ. You're an heir to everything. Where's our inheritance? It's in the promised land. That we're going to reign with Christ forever in, in Israel? Yeah. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you, this, this is not we, now it's you. He's talking to Gentile believers. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those by which, by nature, are not gods. Um, in Galatia, that was ascetic Gnosticism, which meant that um, by denying yourself and, and obtaining through years of study specialized knowledge, you can come to God. It is not of Christ. Not at all. Not even close. And all the pagans, everybody has a desire to worship God within them. And, and every like place picks different things. But if you're, it's the law, Judaism. And they made their own laws because those priests, those dogs wanted to be worshipped. Those fences that we talked about, that's not good. But then they had all these other religions would pop up. So, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature were not gods. Say so what an idol, and it's in scripture. Behind every idol is a demon looking, for, looking to steal worship. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Is this being in bondage to the law again? No. 
is to things of this world, whether to the pagans, it was the Hasidic Gnosticism, to the Jews, it was the rabbinical law, that heavy yoke that was put on them by man. I could go, you observe days and months and seasons of years. Okay, they're observing these things, but they're not getting it. They're going through the routines. They're not getting it. He doesn't say don't do it, but I'm, but I'm afraid for you, at least you have labored in vain. In other words, they still need to show it. They're not going to get saved by doing the law. The law never saved anybody. You can't find it in De Deuteronomy 28 that the law saves you. But that's the fruit. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. How do you say, Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? I'm afraid, least I have labored you in vain. In other words, you're not getting it from me that I'm laboring in vain. Um, tell you what, this video is long enough. This is not talking about not following the law. Paul would be a serious hypocrite if he did. The law was given to bring, and a lot of people talk about the curse of the law. That's Deuteronomy 28, on, or 28, 15 on. The curse of the law is if you're not following it. Where do I go? I'm going to put a video on here that explains some of this. Um, it's from a guy from Creekside Messianic, and he's going to—he'll go through more of of um, um, Galatians four. But here's the thing: <clears throat> if you're brought up believing that Christ fulfilled the law, you don't have to do it anymore. That's how you're going to read Deuteronomy. Excuse me, Galatians four. If you believe that the new covenant replaced the old covenant, the old covenant is gone and done away with, yeah, no. It's in Hebrews, but Hebrews takes it from Deuteronomy. So let's go to Deuteronomy 31. I, I could spend forever talking about the new covenant and how it plays in. It's not even in effect yet. Seriously, it's not in effect yet. I know, I know, it's contrary to everything that you've been told. I remember a pastor I heard one day talking about the new covenant. Oh, that old covenant was all bloody, animals getting killed off. That's oh, a good thing Jesus can't brought in a new covenant, so we don't have to deal with it anymore. Well, they're going to be doing that in the millennial kingdom. Deuteronomy 31, starting in verse 31, and you know what? I am wrong. Eh. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. My apologies. Just going to give you a couple things here. This might be my longest video yet. By the way, the word new is actually renewed. It's the same thing you have for a new moon, same word. Does God like crush the moon and then give you another one? No, it's sort of renewed. Why am I not there? Give me a sec. All right, Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with Israel and the house of Judah. It's not for the Jews. It's not for the Christians. It's for Israel and the house of Judah. Remember, there's a northern kingdom, um, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. Not according to the covenant made in their fathers, the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. Was there a problem with the covenant? Was there a problem with the law? No. They broke it. That was the problem. Though I was a husband to them. Yeah, they were. God was wedded to the Jews, the children of Israel, before... Yeshua came in person to the earth. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Oh, the house of Israel. Now they're back together. That hasn't happened yet. See, before it was Israel and Judah, two separate. After those days, days, thousands of years, days, a thousand years, 
This is a covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. So they're back together yet now at this point. Has that happened? No. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, my Torah, in their minds and in their hearts. Oh, are you getting rid of the Torah? No. He's putting it in the minds and in the hearts. That's what the new covenant is. Hmm. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. Has that happened yet? No. We still need to be sharing Yeshua. We need to be sharing Jesus with people. If not, we're missing it. So how does this thing work? Real simple. The days are coming. Days being thousands of years. A day is a thousand years. Psalm 90. Uh, 2 Peter 3. Okay. But it says the days are coming. So the, those thousands of years hadn't got there when Jeremiah wrote this. Remember Jesus said, this is the blood of my new covenant. So you may have a sacrifice for a covenant. Jesus was that sacrifice. It takes days, thousands of years for this to come into effect. That's the millennial kingdom. That is when Israel and Judea are back together as one. And that's when everybody's going to know the Lord. And he wants to tell people about him. And that's when he's going to put his law into our mind and into our hearts. Did Jesus get rid of that? Did Paul get rid of it? Get rid of Torah, fulfill it, done and everyone? No. No. Anyhow, I thank you for listening. May God bless you. Hey, I appreciate your questions. And if you made it this far in this video, God bless you. Have a great day. Bye.